Good afternoon. Welcome. <clears throat> Welcome to the International Institute. My name is Ken Coleman. I'm the director of the Institute. And uh, it's a, a delight to welcome you, especially our visitors from out of town, the parents, uh, grandparents, and aunts and uncles, and whoever else. Uh, we, we welcome you here. Um, our institute is composed of numerous units. Uh, we're an umbrella unit. Um, and we have the purpose of studying world regions and international themes. Uh, five of those units are uh, celebrating with us today. Um, Center for European Studies. Latin American and Caribbean Studies, Middle East and North African Studies, Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and the Islamic Studies Program. And it's uh, wonderful to celebrate with these students. The Institute has over 400 faculty associated with it. We provide resources, uh, literally millions of dollars, to students and faculty across campus uh, and, the broad, and even the broader community. We bring people together across disciplines and across regional interests. We are a truly global institute. The International Institute is a convening organization. Uh, we break down boundaries and we engage people uh, who otherwise wouldn't come together in the classroom and we bring them together in talks and lectures and seminars. Now let me say that um, it's common to talk about students today as um, myopic or lacking curiosity or lacking attention span or always on their devices and their phones and not listening and not paying attention to the broader world. Um, I think this is false, um, at least the students I know here. But especially students that we're celebrating here in this institute today, you're a testament to against that, that kind of complaint. In fact, a great many students enter this university with tremendous curiosity about the world. Um, outside, that is, the world outside of the United States. The students that are curious to learn languages, travel for academic purposes, study and conduct research on global and international issues, and stay engaged with some of the most important global topics of our time. Our students come to Michigan expecting a world-class education. And they get it. We have a world-class faculty. We admit world-class students, so they're sitting next to people who are genuinely curious, curious like they are. And here in the Institute, we add value to the Michigan experience by educating them beyond the American borders and broadening their scope. Our students here that we're celebrating have taken a step of broadening their academic purview by getting one of the various degrees here from our institute. They have, in many cases, stepped out of their comfort zone. As I've said, they've learned difficult foreign languages and they've traveled abroad. But I think, importantly, they've sought out courses across departments and participated in interdisciplinary seminars and courses. It's difficult to do that, and it's difficult to do it well, and they have. So this is a celebration of these students. They're the focus of our attention. And they deserve our congratulations. I have to say, as a faculty member, um, I also give them my gratitude. Um, I, I'm thankful to them for their interest in the topics that we study and analyze as researchers, for their respectful engagement with each other, and with all the things that this fine institution offers. And I think it's a joy and a privilege to have the experience of teaching this kind of student, these quality young people. So where do they go from here? What do they do? Well, many of them will go on to further study. They'll go out in the world of work, perhaps, with valuable knowledge and skills related to engaging with people comfortably from foreign countries, knowing about the cultures, languages, literature, governments, policies, economies, religions, fashions, and art from places that they didn't grow up with in. When you're done with your studies, you say, you know, I made it. <clears throat> but for those of us that are on the other side, the older of us, the elder of us, we know that it's really a beginning. That you came here to this world-class place, 
and you do world-class work, but now you move on and your education continues. And we like to say here at Michigan that we graduate leaders and best, and what does that mean? Well, I like to think of it as meaning that we graduate people who continue to be thinkers and doers. They're people who use their heads and their hearts and their bodies to improve the world. And they're people who act with integrity, always. And that's what being leaders and best means. And that's what we should be proud of with these graduates, that we are instilling in them these values. And I'm very proud that to, to, to kick this off, this exciting celebration. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite to the podium Josh Cole, who is the director of the Center for European Studies here at the Institute. Josh. Thank you, Ken, for those very inspiring words. Um, this is among the more pleasant tasks that uh, falls upon directors. I'm very pleased to welcome you all here today to the International Institute to celebrate the uh, accomplishments and, and hard work um, of, of your sons and daughters um, and friends. Um, so my task today at first is to introduce a series of speakers who will talk a little bit about the work they did as students here at the University of Michigan's International Institute. Um, they will give a, 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 a brief uh, talk um, and I'll introduce them individually. Um, and uh, feel free to ask questions afterwards uh, as they tell you about their experiences. So our first speaker today um, is Emma G. Kelly, who is a graduate with a BS degree in Latin American and Caribbean studies uh, and environmental studies. Uh, the title of her presentation is Environmental Studies in Costa Rica. Emma? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm going to get my water ready here. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, in addition to studying abroad in Costa Rica, I've studied abroad in a couple of, well, also in the Dominican Republic. So, in addition to talking about what I've done in Costa Rica, I'm going to give you kind of a, a history of, of my experience with language study and study abroad in general. So you could say my journey began eight years ago when at the very last minute I decided to take Spanish instead of French for my high school language. So there I was the first day of class in September learning my perro from my perro, but versus dog, and <laughs> giggling over words like guisante and sacapuntas, which is still my favorite Spanish word. My friends and I were fascinated by the way these new words fell in our, felt in our mouths and we came up with strange combinations of words just to have an excuse to say them. Yo quiero uvas con mantequilla, which literally translates to, I want grapes with butter. It's nonsensical, I know, but I find that one of the best ways to learn a language is to be a bit silly. After four years of high school study, my senior Spanish class took a service trip to the Dominican Republic to volunteer in an orphanage. This was to be my first time traveling in a Spanish-speaking country, and I really had no idea what to expect. Would I be able to get by on my very little amount of Spanish? Would they be able to understand me? I had no idea. I quickly discovered that the deliberate Spanish that my high school teacher used was a far cry from the spoken vernacular of the local people, and I quickly made, repite, por favor, repeat it again, please, one of my catchphrases. Yet, in spite of my sloppy verb conjugations and my lack of vocabulary, I found that everywhere I went, my Spanish was greeted with enthusiasm and even gratitude. On our last day in the Dominican Republic, our volunteer group went to a little museum in town. At first, I wasn't getting much out of it as most of the work in the museum was in Spanish and had no English translation. And then I walked into a room with this big mural on the wall, and that's what caught my attention. One of the men in our group had a question about the mural, but was unsure of how to ask the elderly curator, and so he asked me to talk to the man for him. I stuck out my hand and said, Me llamo Emma, es un placer a conocerte, which basically means, my name is Emma, it's a pleasure to meet you. And a huge grin broke out across this man's face. 
I was speaking his language and knew how to greet him respectfully. I couldn't speak Spanish that well, but he was so excited that I was at least trying to speak Spanish and not just assuming that he spoke my language. He couldn't wait to pull down books to share with us and point out on a map of the United States where he had traveled. I couldn't understand everything he told us, but I translated the best I could for my friends. When it was time for us to leave, each of my fellow volunteers shook this man's head, hand, saying gracias and adios. And when I stuck out my hand to say goodbye, he pushed it aside and gave me the most sincere and grandfatherly hug. Now let's jump ahead to the summer after my freshman year in college here at U of M. That year I had declared my major in environmental science and I had just finished the intensive language program in the residential college in Spanish. Once again, I was getting ready to head off to Latin America, but this time the destination was Costa Rica and the tropic was freshwater, um, excuse me, freshwater management in the tropics, a perfect combination of my Spanish and environmental interests. Do I have a picture? Yes, okay, I'll get to that. I have a picture of that trip. Uh, the trip was a whirlwind overview of the freshwater resources of Costa Rica, taking us to dams and irrigation projects, tilapia farms, and even a meeting with the brother of the first Costa Rican astronaut in space, though I'm not sure what the connection was to water there. We stayed at Earth University, where I met agronomy students who were just as passionate about the environment as I was. I learned about biodigesters, that's the top picture on the left. Um, this is an innovative technology that reduces wastewater input, sorry, reduces wastewater inputs to the environment while also producing biogas for use in home cooking. And I also had the opportunity to teach school children in a small village about watersheds and how their actions upstream influence, or sorry, impact their neighbors downstream. Now, I must tell you that I'm a bit of a homebody, and no matter how long I've been away from home, I'm always excited to come back to my little corner of northern Michigan, where I'm from. This is the place where I fall asleep to waves crashing on the shore of Grand Traverse Bay and wake up to the sounds of morning doves and chickadees outside my window. Yet for the first time after this trip, I truly did not want to come home to Leelanau County. I had fallen in love with Costa Rica, its people, its natural environment, and its laid back attitude of pura vida, or pure life. As soon as I returned to the U of M campus in the fall, I began searching out opportunities to go back to Costa Rica and continue my academic connection with that part of the world. Though I'd heard of the Spanish major here at University of Michigan, I really wasn't interested in the classic literature or the history of Spain that that department focuses on. What has captivated my interest ever since that first trip to the Dominican Republic in 2010 was language's capacity to open doors, to allow me entrance into another culture and a people who would otherwise be foreign to me. So when I discovered the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Department quite by accident at a study abroad fair in the Union, I knew that I had found the perfect way to combine my cultural and political interests into an academic minor. By far, the peak in my LAX career, Latin American and Caribbean Studies, known as LAX, um, by far the peak in that career was my return trip to Costa Rica as a junior in college, when I spent an entire semester taking classes on the country's politics, um, economics, and environment, and conducting my own research on fisheries management. This was my chance to tr be truly immersed in the culture, to become a part of the daily lives of a Costa Rican family, and to increase confidence in my Spanish skills. Uh, this is my host family here on the bottom. We're eating Costa Rican tacos together. After two months of classes in the capital city and environmental field work in the countryside, the third month of the program was dedicated to independent research. By far, this was the most challenging part of the program. For nearly a month, I lived on the Isla de Chira, a small fishing island that only recently got electricity and still has no paved roads. Though I had come to study fisheries, the things I learned about myself and where I come from far surpassed my original research goals. My research in Costa Rica was inspired by the fishing traditions in my home region of Leelanau County. Since the mid-1900s, fishermen have been working out of Leland's fish town on the shores of Lake Michigan, setting their nets for whitefish and chub and other Lake Michigan fish. Though the industry has waxed and waned over the past half century, fishing has always been an important part of our cultural heritage. And so when 10 years ago, developers set their sights on Fishtown, wanting to turn the smoke houses and fishing shanties into condos and boutiques, the community rallied together to save the historic village 
and the commercial fishing industry. This connection to fisheries in my home region both inspired and gave relevancy to my research on fisheries on the Isla de Chira. More than a chance to learn research skills and practice my Spanish, my investigations provided a new perspective on an issue of local importance to me. What I learned from my investigations is that fishing practices on the Isla de Chira are not sustainable. Illegal techniques are decimating the fish populations. So even though I got two there, there really aren't that many fish out there and people aren't able to support themselves on the fish. Government regulation is essentially absent. And in order for fish populations to recover, fishermen really have to stay on shore. Yet this is the only lifestyle they know, and so fishing continues despite diminishing returns. By connecting what I observed through my research with my own experiences at home in Leelanau County, I was able to better understand why the people on the Isla de Chira would continue fishing despite the diminishing returns. In northern Michigan and on a small island in Costa Rica, fishing is more than an industry. It is a lifestyle and a culture that sustains its people. For eight years now, I have been studying Spanish, and each year I learn a little bit more about what a tool this language is for me. When I went to the Dominican Republic, I discovered that Spanish can be a language or can be a doorway to other cultures, allowing me to communicate with people who would otherwise be removed from my experiences. When I went to Costa Rica for the first time for my freshwater studies trip, I discovered how Spanish and my environmental interests can be combined to form a more stronger tool set. And most recently, I have found that Spanish is much more than a doorway, but a bridge, connect, a two-way bridge, a connection to another culture that allows me to connect what I have learned abroad to my everyday experiences at home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma, for that. Um, uh, inspire. I think you get a sense here of uh, how exciting it is to be a professor at this university when you have students with the energy and enthusiasm of Emma Kelly. Um, I, I did want to leave the opportunity for anybody in the audience to ask Emma a question about her experiences. <laughs> um, so if you're willing to answer any questions, if anybody has them. Does anybody have a question? We do have time uh, about the research that she conducted. Yeah, please. ¿Cómo fue su experiencia? ¿Cómo fue qué? La experiencia. La experiencia fue buenísimo. Sí, buenísimo. I, I would repeat it any day. I, it was studying, oh, sorry. I'm sure anyone who has studied abroad would, has studied abroad would know that it's very challenging. There are things that come up that you would never expect, um, but it's also an intense period of growth. Um, yeah, I still keep in touch with my host family here. Um, I got to be outside every single day trying new fruits and vegetables that were so strange to my palate. Um, in this top picture, I'm eating uh, a cocoa fruit. Normally we think of the cocoa bean, which is made for, used for making chocolate, but we never get to eat the fruit and it's so good and tangy. So if you ever get to Costa Rica, make sure to ask for cocoa fruit. <laughs> you know we are Cuban? No, I didn't. No, 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 we are Cuban. Right, yes. Uh, my daughter, you see her? She is my little princess right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know, everything coming down, you know, side pole and everything. <laughs> Don't feel bad. My dad will embarrass me after this too. He's here also. <laughs> she has she has to do a uh, prop, <laughs> you know, because we are still from Cuba. Twenty years ago on the raft, and we are here living the American dream. And. Yeah. Anybody else have any? Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, Dad's gonna embarrass me now. <laughs> okay, this is a setup. Oh no. What's next? OK, so yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, so my next plan is to go to the University of Idaho and study environmental education. Um, Spanish is kind of this, this tool that boosts my environmental interests. I'm majoring in environmental science. Um, so I'm hoping to study environment. I will be studying environmental education. And my plan is to eventually come back to the Great Lakes region. And hopefully, I'll be able to incorporate Spanish in there somehow, um, whether it's working with the migrants that live in our area or or communicating with my host family. I, I know I'll want to continue speaking Spanish for as long as I can. So and I thank Lax for that, for helping me with that. So thank you. Our next speaker today is Jesse Stuhlman, 
who has a degree in Middle Eastern and North African Studies and Spanish. Um, the title of her presentation today is A Joint Christian and Muslim Reconquista of Valencia, a Comparative Case Study of Abu Zayyad and Al-Azraq. Hello. I hope you can bear with me while I take you seven centuries into the past. <laughs> um, um, before I begin, I first want to thank my wonderful thesis advisor, Professor Eric Calderwood back there, um, for his help not only on this thesis, but also as an incredible advocate for me since before I was even a student here. And I also want to thank the Center and the International Institute as my experience here has made my decision to leave Barnard two years ago worthwhile. Oh, and finally, thank you to my friends and family who, keep you, who kept me sane along the way. <laughs> um, so the centerpiece of my project is five military treaties signed between King Jaume I of Aragon, Abu Zaid, the last Almohad governor of Valencia, and the Mudejar Lord al Asraq in 13th century Valencia. These case studies serve as the mechanisms through which I complicate notions of medieval Iberian history by positing a contingent relationship between medieval beings and contemporary societies. In this attempt, I challenge three dominant historiographical narratives, the first being a Reconquista narrative, as articulated by Sanchez Albornaz, wherein medieval Iberia is solely defined by conflictive interreligious contact. And on the other end of the spectrum, I confront Castro's now famous convivencia narrative, which insists upon the uniquely harmonious character of interfaith interactions in medieval Iberia. Lastly, I attempt to debunk a postmodernist narrative, which, as Din Shah notes, reads this past as a dense, unvarying, and eminently obvious monolith against which modernity and postmodernity groovily emerge. Using Benjamin, White, and Certeau, I identify the central issue of these narratives as resting upon their positivistic precepts, wherein the historian, according to Benjamin, quote, grasps the constellation which his own era has formed with a definite earlier one. I also use Nuremberg's work to complicate the notion that conflict and coexistence are mutually exclusive. Above all, I attempt to get medieval to use Jen Shah's term, by deconstructing common characterizations of the Middle Ages as wholly divided between self and other, in this case, Muslim and Christian. Here's our cast of characters. Um, King Jaume I of Aragon, el conquistador, inherited rule over areas of northeastern Spain and southern France in 1208, until his death in 1276, during which his kingdom spread to the Bal Balearic Islands and Valencia. Abu Zaid, the last Almohad Wali, or governor of Valencia, and grandnephew of the first Almohad Caliph, Abd al Mutmin, experienced resistance in his kingdom almost immediately from both Muslim and Christian elements. Abd al Asraq, much less is known, as he is not extensively covered in either contemporary European or Arabic sources. Nonetheless, this wazir, or lord of Alcala, held much land on the southern portion of Valencia and negotiated with King Jaume I and his rival. Ferdinand III of Castile. As for historiographical research, I refer to Shabas and Jorens, a 19th century Spanish historian, as well as Ro uh, Robert Burns, a contemporary American historian, and Maria del Carmen Barcelo Torres, a contemporary Spanish historian. The origins of the Reconquista narrative are not entirely retrospective. As Urban II includes Iber the Iberian Peninsula in his initial call to crusade in 1095. Additionally, rhetoric from church administrators of the time, like Bernard de Clairvaux, did characterize the Crusaders' mission in terms of total annihilation of Muslims. Similarly, Pope Innocent III reinforced the need for Christians to live under exclusively Christian authority. Nonetheless, these ideological considerations become muddled, as we shall see, in the Iberian context. In the second treaty made between King Jaume I and Abu Zaid in 1229, the Reconquista of Valencia is described as your conquest, vuestra conquista, by both Abu Zaid and King Jaume. Additionally, explicitly religious rhetoric is scarce and ambiguous, with the only instances in this treaty being a few mentions of hands of the faithful, manos de fieles, by King Jaume I to describe the undetermined nobles that will safeguard Abu Zaid's castles. Jumping to the fourth treaty signed in 1237, 
probably after Abu Zaid's conversion to Christianity, most content remains the same. However, it includes two new features, the first being a stipulation that Abu Zaid receive extra reward from future pacts with Muslims, and the second being the king's only mention of God in any of his treaties with Abu Zaid, upon whom he rests his commitment to these pacts. Yet, he also affirms his fealty by his royal word, thus seemingly equalizing the weight of his faith and monarchical duty. In the secondary literature, Abu Zaid is viewed as a figure towing the line between two separate wor worlds, one Muslim and one Christian. When analyzing the stamp that he used to sign the fourth treaty, which you can see here, uh, it reads his Arabic name and al mohad title in Romance language, some form of Castilian or Aragonese. Um, and Shabazz contends that seemingly Abu Zaid, according, uh, considering the stamp, does not want to give up his imperial Muslim heritage even as he is incorporated into a nominally Christian Aragonese court. Burns similarly, similarly contends that Abu Zaid traveled through many gradients of loosely defined Muslim and Christian nobility during his lifetime. Um, but in this entire process, he and his son never stopped articulating their imperial Muslim heritage, even after converting to Christianity, supposedly. Um, Barcelo Torres argues that in this process, however, Abu Zaid abandoned his Muslim community. Thus, from this alliance, we can determine that the Valencian Reconquista was not marked by interreligious antagonism, as both fought together in a joint conquista of Valencia. Furthermore, Abu Zaid complicates the utility of religious identity in determining individual sociocultural practices in the medieval period, as is common, considering that he does not exclusively associate with either a Christian or Muslim tradition. Lastly, the relationship questions whether the Valencian Crusade represents an exclusively Christian endeavor in either rhetoric or practice. Uh, moving on to both the Romance and Arabic versions of Al-Asraq's bilingual treaty with King Jaume, which is a rare document, uh, like the Abu Zaid Pacts, established a joint military venture permitting Al-Asraq to continue fighting. However, in the Romance text, al Asraq explicitly submits himself as a vassal to Prince Alfonso, King Jaume I's representative, which is reinforced by an asymmetrical power dynamic in the language of the treaty. However, in the Arabic version, there is no mention of a vassalage agreement, and the language used does not reinforce an unequal power dynamic. Additionally, it mentions new concessions to al Asraq's supporters. Um, and pictured here, you can see the interlinear text, the bilingual treaty that I'm speaking about. It starts with, I think it starts with the Arabic. Oh, no, it starts with the Romance, and then the Arabic is in between. Um, to complicate matters further, both the Romance and Arabic versions of these treaties were drawn up by Jewish members of King Jaume's chancery, and each seems to be dated a year apart. This inconsistency has yet to be resolved and revolves in part around a debate over whether or not the two versions actually display different content. The secondary literature is scant on al Asraq. Shabazz provides little more than a brazen characterization of him as a, quote, obstinate Moor whose war King Jaume had to, quote, suffer through. Meanwhile, Burns and Barcelo Torres argue over whether or not al Asraq and other Mudejar lords of the period were feudalized into Christian aristocracy of the time. Nonetheless, al Asraq's name and historical importance are preserved and reenacted in the festivals of Moros and Cristianos today, celebrated in areas of, of Valencia, most namely El Coy, where you hear his name transmorgified into dragon or dragon and used to, quote, threaten naughty children in the idiomatic expression, El Drac will get you, as Burns notes. Um, considering the differences in content between the Arabic and Romance versions of this treaty, it's impossible to verify a feudal relationship existed between El Asraq and King Jaume. Additionally, the joint military expeditions discussed are not formulated using the same language as the alliances made with Abu Zaid, indicating that the conqueror king did not execute any calculated policy, crusader or otherwise, in his crusade of Valencia. Furthermore, the agreement is entirely devo devoid of references to interreligious antagonism, again indicating that this Reconquista was not a crusade, at least in practice. 
Uh, El Asrak's modern reconfiguration as a monster for children to fear in Valencian folklore points towards the continuing mysteries surrounding the man who stunted King Jaume I's career as El Conquistador, and yet is still missing somehow from most extant documentation. Okay, in sum, my findings further bolster claims that medieval Iberia cannot be understood as a monolith, wherein either convivencia or perpetual interreligious conflict reigned supreme. It is left to be determined whether the microcosm of the Valencian Reconquista uh, marked by interreligious conquest represents an exceptional situation or a larger pattern during the crusade era. When papal crusade ideology meets other local contexts characterized by porous borders uh, like Eastern Europe, it is difficult to imagine that perpetual interreligious antagonism in warfare ever existed. Uh, whatever the case, these two figures highlight the need for religious identity markers particularly in the medieval period, to be viewed through a multi-dimensional lens. In working to understand the heterogeneity of medieval narratives, we will further unpack the analytical and identity frameworks that permeate throughout act academia today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but what is out there with, with, with time that one could look at as a material resolution of some of the things that are left unresolved in your work? Is yeah. there more that could be done, or would that be then a short? Um, there's definitely stuff already being done. Um, I have to say personally, the reason I came to this institution is because we have a growing program here of Mediterranean studies that is not Eurocentric and attempts to address issues like this medieval issue um, and also contemporary issues. Um, so I think work is definitely being done. In terms of a, a more nuanced reading of the Crusade era, uh, I used in my research a book by Riley Smith called The Crusades, not very uh, imaginative, and um, he does a pretty fantastic job of, I mean, he doesn't resolve the issues. I think the issues, the, the reality is that they can't be resolved because the situation at, in that time period was just as nuanced as, uh, you know, the situations we confront today. Um, so, but I would recommend Riley Smith as a good read, nonetheless. <laughs> is there any other questions? Oh, yeah. Very obscure, yeah, very obscure and niche. I was quite worried that I was going to lose all you guys. Um, so I wrote a paper for Professor Hussein Fancy's class. He teaches a class on crusade and jihad. That's excellent. If any of you are still students at Michigan, take that class. Um, and he introduced me to these figures as I used to live in Valencia when I was younger. Um, so kind of an emotional connection to the land. Um, and I have constant. I've been studying Spain and uh, the Spanish-speaking world for quite a while, and I've always find it found it difficult to comprehend how such a linear and definite narrative could explain 800 years of history. Um, so I think that was part of what drove me to choose this topic. And my advisor was uh, gracious enough to allow me to kind of stay on this very strange uh, path. <laughs> but yeah, is that it? Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Um, our last speaker today is Leslie Kucharski, who has a dual BA in Russian and Eastern European Studies and in economics. And the title of, of uh, is, I'm sorry, Leslie is, okay, Leslie. Um, uh, the title of her presentation is Small Business in Provincial Russia. Thank you, Leslie. Okay, so I didn't prepare a speech, um, so I hope this turns out fine. <laughs> uh, I wanna start off thanking my beautiful sister and my mother right here in the front row. They've been very supportive of me in my um, adventures here at Michigan, um, especially studying Russian. I know they're very puzzled with that choice, which maybe some of you guys are as well. Um, one of the first questions I get is, um, oh, 
Do you want your bib <laughs> bibliography? Um, why Russia? Uh, I don't really have any connections to Russia. I'm actually Polish, so given the history, um, you'd think I wouldn't really like Russia very much. <laughs> but um, I was studying political science and economics, and I took Professor Ronald Suni's class. I don't know if any of you guys have had him. He's a really great professor. Um, and before I came to college, I didn't really know, I didn't know anything about Russia. You know, I had the stereotypes, vodka, bombs, and communism. <laughs> um, so it really just flipped everything around. Um, and it was just the one class that I had here that was a wow factor. Um, you know, I was talking about it with everybody, um, all my friends, my family, sorry. <laughs> I know you didn't want to hear a lot of what I had to say, but, you know, I was just, I loved it, and I fell in love. Um, so I traveled to Russia twice. Last year I studied abroad. Um, the first time I went was two years ago with the alternative spring break program. Um, so just one week I spent in Russia and we went to Vitegra, which is a small town. It's 430 kilometers from St. Petersburg, which is about 260 miles. Um, so Detroit to Chicago, it's 280 miles. Um, I guess actually go to this. So that's um, us in St. Petersburg in the top. Um, that's the Hermitage, the main square in St. Petersburg. And then here's us in Vitegra. So you can just see, um, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of perspective. A lot of people like don't know much about Russia. And then when they, what they do know is like Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, but Russia is a country with like 143 million people. And there's um, 11, 11 and a half million live officially in Moscow and about 5 million in St. Petersburg. So that leaves majority of the country, people are living outside of these two cities. Um, so they're very different. Um, yeah, more of the countryside in Vitegra. And um, okay, so I studied the business atmosphere. I wanted to combine my interest in economics with Russian. Um, it wasn't a huge project that I did, like no grand thesis, just kind of wanted to see what it's like to do business in Russia, um, in provincial Ru Russia specifically, because as you guys know, there's a lot of corruption in Russia, and I just wanted to observe that relationship on a smaller scale. And these are kind of um, a gloomy, gloomy conclusions. <laughs> um, yes. Um, don't ask questions, don't question the administration, don't challenge, and keep up on all regulations. So I talked to three people. I interviewed them with the help of a translator. At that point, my Russian was pretty basic. I couldn't, couldn't do any interviews, um, so I had help. Um, and the first guy that I talked to, he was the head of a business incubator in the region. Um, so he's helping other people form small businesses, and. He saw in this area um, tourism, that there is growing demand. Um, and so he wanted to start a business. And he, you know, he was trying, just, you know, buying property and stuff. But um, he ran into some problems with, specifically with the taxes. Like over the past year, um, before he tried to start his business, uh, property taxes increased 106%. And Obviously, that was a huge challenge to him, cutting into his startup costs. Um, and, you know, he confronted the local administration saying, look, like the business department saying, I'm trying to, this is what I'm trying to do, this is what's hurting me. And they pretty much just said nothing to him. And naturally, I asked him, like, well, why do you think they didn't want to help you? It's their job to help promote small business. And he's like, well, they didn't say anything to me, but he said, one of them was just a veterinarian and another was a former police officer. Both of them had no, really no background in business or economics and they're just, he said that they were just, you know, in office trying to do well for themselves, didn't really care that much about what their post was in helping other businessmen. Um, so that's the don't question the administration because they can't really help. And then that moves also into the second point, don't challenge the administration. Um, Another, a woman that I talked to, she owned a salon, and um, she was running into problems with property taxes as well, and she confronted the administration about this problem, and 
same kind of reaction, and she showed interest in running for one of the positions that the veterinarian and the police officer had occupied. And the response that she got to that was the local authorities seized her property on the grounds that she wasn't kept up on all her regulations, like fire regulations, just, they are probably making up some regulations, she said, and so they seized her property and she lost her business. Um, so yeah, those, <laughs> those were the, my two interviews. I also had another one with the head of the, uh, ho the hotel that we stayed at in Fuitigra, and he, I guess to give it a little less biased perspective, he said he didn't have any problems with um, the local administration with respect to corruption. Um, in the interview, I could tell he didn't really want to talk to me that much, so it just kind of ended, and he's like, everything's fine, and I was like, okay. <laughs> that's great. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, that's my presentation. <laughs> and um, well, I guess I will say it's not, I mean, that is like a gloomy, gloom and doom presentation of Russia, but you know, it really is what I learned like studying there. Um, you know, while despite all the problems that they have, like with their politics, so this is a picture of um, we were there the we left the day of the presidential elections. So this was two years ago, right before Putin got reelected. Um, but yeah, so despite all the political hardships, like Russia is really, it really is a great country, and I'm actually going back there next year. Um, I got into Middlebury. Uh, which is in Vermont, a language school, and I'm going to pursue a master in Russian. So, yeah. That's it. <laughs> oh, any questions? Can, can I, I, I'm curious about, so you spoke of your conversations with the business owners. Mm -hmm. Did they talk about the experience in the 1990s of the transition to a market economy? Um, and how that was a, a period that was that was expensive for them. There was difficulty paying the people. Yeah. They came to depend on those um, large state-owned firms. They were privatized. How did they talk about that period as a as a as a reference point in their in, in their general um, own sense of the business world yeah. and being affected economically? Not really. Um, the only one who actually really did talk about the nineties was the owner of the hotel, and he didn't have any problems, but. Mm -hmm. Because I asked him, I was like, well, have you like ever really had, since you've had your business, any problems? Like even during, I said, we asked him like, during the 90s um, when businesses were first becoming legal. And yeah, all the transition from state-owned to private, but he didn't really say much. Yeah. So unfortunately, I didn't, I mean, it was a pretty, it was a pretty short trip. I didn't get to extensively look into it, but yeah. <laughs> I think you can see here in these three students um, the kind of extraordinary amount of uh, the diversity of interest um, and activity that takes place under the rubric of the International Institute. Um, both uh, people engaged in contemporary issues, um, this wonderful example of Emma's work, which we don't, we don't normally think of a necessary connection between environmental studies and Spanish, and yet she was able to take this and in the, the, the kinds of work that she does on water management, the, many of the issues that environmental scientists deal with are in fact global in their scope. And so uh, 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 an encounter, um, uh, tr foreign travel, experiences in other parts of the world that can give you a sense of the way that different peoples and different cultures are struggling with similar kinds of problems can give you a very different kind of perspective. Um, very similar, um, I, I would just want to just kind of sum up if I can, because I was really struck by all three of these presentations. Jesse's um, marvelous talk, can we just sort of stop and ponder a minute the technical skills that were required to produce a thesis in which she was engaged not only in working in medieval Arabic, but in medieval Spanish, um, and challenging some very fundamental assumptions that people make about what religious identities are. This is something that many people certainly have very strong opinions about in the present, and yet to assume that the kinds of religious identities that people express nowadays also existed in the past 
would be a distortion of, of the historical record and her ability to read those texts. This is, again, a kind of example of the kind of uh, wonderful work that is encouraged by the area studies, uh, area studies groups at the International Institute. And Leslie's work on Russia, too, the, the idea that we would be able to send a student working on economics to Russia to ask questions about this, this in kind of momentous transition that was taking place and that you could get a kind of firsthand experience um, these are the kinds of things that the International Institute has really worked hard, the kinds of opportunities that the R International Institute works very hard um, to create for students, and we're so gratified to have students like these. So let me thank them again for their presentations. We're now going to move on to the second part of our, um, uh, of our ceremony today. I'm going to, um, uh, uh, we're, we're, I'm going to, first of all, I'll introduce some of the graduating students for the Center of European Studies, and then I'll call up some other directors to introduce their students. I'm going to ask that um, those students who are here, many of the students who are uh, receiving awards or certificates are also participating in other graduation ceremonies, and so not everybody is here. But as we read the names of, uh, of those students, would you please come up and receive your award? So I'll go first. Um, as I, as I uh, Ken said, I'm the director of the Center for European Studies. The Center for European Studies has a, a number of programs. We sponsor a, a, a lecture series um, uh, where we invite distinguished visitors from other universities, both in North America and in Europe, uh, to come and speak. We had a wonderful series this year on the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of World War I. Last year, we also had an ongoing series on the European financial crisis. Um, uh, but uh, today, we're here to celebrate the accomplishments of our students who are inscribed in our graduate program. We offer now a graduate certificate in European studies, and we offer a minor in European studies for undergraduates. Um, and let me just um, call out the names of those students who have participated in um, these certificate programs and in the minor programs. And um, let's uh, uh, take a minute to appreciate the work that went into them. Um, our very first, the Graduate Certificate in European Studies is brand new. And our very first student is uh, finishing this year. And he is also getting a degree from the uh, School of Public Policy. So he's not here. But because he was in my class and I appreciate the work he did, let me please announce his name. He is Jordi Prat Tuca, who he is uh, from Barcelona. Um, in, and in two years, he managed to get his master's in public policy and a graduate certificate in um, European studies. Is, is Jordi is not here. I, I think that's right. He told me he's not here. Um, we have two students finishing with a minor in modern European studies this year. That would be first Paul Braverman. Is Paul here? No. Um, and finally, Melinda Stang. Is Melinda here? Um, no. Well, I'm sure they'll uh, uh, have their uh, diplomas ma uh, mailed to them. Let me now introduce to you first uh, Lenny Urania Valerio, who will say something about the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies um, and present the certificates to the LAX graduates. Well, first of all, I would like to congratulate all the students for their accomplishments and express my gratitude to their parents, relatives, and friends for supporting them in their academic endeavors. The Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies is extremely proud of our students for the commitment they have shown towards the region by learning a language and deepening their knowledge of um, Latin American cultures. Their work and expertise do a great service in terms of fostering mutual understanding with members of our neighboring countries and millions of Latinos currently living in the United States. It was a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to work closely with a group of students with such cultural understanding, intellectual curiosity, and academic strengths. We all at LAX feel truly rewarded to have students like you. And we want to thank you for all the excellence you bring to our center and the field. For those of you who are not familiar with our center, um, let me briefly describe what, uh, to you what we do at LAX. We are a national resource center supported by a Title VI grant from the Department of Education to promote the study of Latin American cultures and less commonly taught languages such as um, Portuguese, Quechua, and more recently, Nahuatl. 
We collaborate with faculty members and students across the disciplines to bring speakers from all over Latin America and create teaching opportunities related to the area. We also work closely with public schools and the Ann Arbor community to support a wide array of cultural events. LAC strives to provide students with academic and cultural opportunities that enhance their trainings beyond the classroom. Our concentration minor and graduate certificate degrees are designed to provide students with a rigorous multidisciplinary approach to the study of Latin America and the Caribbean. Most of our students go abroad to learn a language, do coursework, or work on fascinating research projects like the one you just heard today from Emma Kelly. And let me tell you that I felt really moved by listening to Emma's speech because that's the, the kind of student that you get in, in, in the center. Um, I, we really feel proud because they really understand our culture. And being born and raised in Latin America, it always makes me feel really glad to work closely with such bright students. Um, many of them also do volunteering work to help communities in different parts of the, the region, which is what our graduate um, Kyra Money will do in the summer with the Quito project. And other students are so committed to the region that they feel more at home in Latin America than anywhere else, uh, which is how graduate Al Alana Tabak feels each time she visits Brazil. And she will be spending her summer in Salvador Bahia watching the World Cup. And Alana, we are very jealous of you, so you have to send us many pictures to make it up to us. <laughs> So congratulations and muchas felicidades to all of you. And now uh, let me acknowledge this, the graduates who could not be here with us today. So graduating with a bachelor's degree in Latin American Caribbean Studies, we have Patrick Fraser, John Hoff, Jill Mast, and Sarah Paulin. And graduating with a minor in Latin American Caribbean Studies, this year we have um, Jesus Amalguer Flores, Mary Catherine Goddard, Jacob Houston, Joseph Cosa, Janelle Molina, and Tara Wells. And now join me to congratulate our bachelor's degree recipient, Kara Money. Please come up to the front. Elena Tabak, who's also graduating with bachelor's degree from Latin American Korean Studies. <laughs> and last but not least, Emma Kelly, who is graduating with a minor from LAX. Thank you. And now I will call to the podium um, Mirge Gotzek, who is the director for the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies to present certificates to their graduates. Thank you very much. I'm actually the associate director. <laughs> uh, the director is Juan Cole, who is here as well. Uh, but I tended to work much more with them on a daily basis, and that's why I'm here. Uh, the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies uh, uh, has been in uh, existence for a long time. It uh, celebrated its 50th uh, 50 uh, year anniversary in 2011. Uh, it is an important center because it enables us to learn more about a part of the world that is often seen as the other and therefore um, uh, marginalized and, and, and ostracized. Um, most of our students uh, learn uh, Turkish or Arabic, uh, Persian or um, Jewish, uh, depending on, uh, uh, or Hebrew, obviously, in, <laughs> 
in, in, in Israel and elsewhere. And uh, they are uh, uh, all very motivated, very exciting. And uh, like my colleague, I was born and raised in Istanbul, Turkey. It gives me a great uh, courage and excitement uh, to know that uh, we will be uh, actually bestowing the future of this country and U.S. foreign policy, at least to our students partially, who, who know what they're doing. And we hope that, you know, uh, they would continue to be important uh, in the future as well. We do have uh, master's um, students as well as uh, a Bachelor of, of, of Arts and, and minors. I do not know how many of them are here because quite a number of them has is the case at Michigan all the time, are doing other things at other places because we have so many things going on all the time. So I will uh, read uh, um, those uh, students of ours uh, uh, that have graduated um, with a menace uh, degree in uh, Master of Arts in Middle Eastern and North African Studies. Uh, and they are Betsy Fisher, who has a dual degree with law and I know she's not here because she has to be in court, <laughs> not, you know, <laughs> as a part of her training, uh, not in a bad way, hopefully. <laughs> uh, David Hilden, uh, who is actually with the U.S. military, and he has to be at another place. Uh, uh, Peter Kitlas, uh, well, I don't know where he's going to be. Uh, <laughs> Christopher Phillips and Hazel Unger. Yes, those are our master's students. And now I turn on to our Bachelor of Arts students. Um, and we have uh, six. Uh, I will start off uh, with uh, Samia Ayash, Fatima Farouk, Tyler Jones, Zeynep Khalil, Jessie Stolman, I know she's here. She's not going to be able to escape it. <laughs> yes, please do come up here. <laughs> and I will there. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, here we go. <laughs> and uh, she also uh, received it with honors. Uh, which, of course, is even more difficult and challenging to do, but Jessie can handle anything. <laughs> I know her well. Uh, Robert Sullivan. And then there is also one person who has a minor in Middle Eastern and North African studies, and that's Jason Stafford. And that will be all. Thank you all for coming. Our next speaker will be Sofia Kagi, who is the Associate Director of the Center for Russian, Eastern European, and Eurasian Studies. Um, she will present the certificates for the Reese graduates, um, and, the, and she will also be awarding the Meyer Prize. Hello. Uh, CREES a US, is a U.S. Department of Education designated and funded national resource center for Russian, East European, and uh, Eurasian studies. We have administered bachelor's and master's degrees for over 50 years, and undergraduate minors and a graduate certificate program for over 10 years. Uh, before I present the certificates, I would like to read Professor Olga Mayorova's, uh, Chris Director's address uh, to our graduate students. Uh, she has to be elsewhere, and she asked me to read this address on her behalf. Dear Chris MA students, a few days ago I signed the certificates confirming that you have fulfilled all the Chris requirements for graduation. It was an exciting day for me, as I vividly remember you at the beginning of your graduate studies path in the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. It has been a pleasure and privilege to work with you 
and guide you uh, through the Chris MA program. I found it rewarding to watch how your knowledge solidified, your research and analytical skills strengthened, and your passion for our region kept growing. I congratulate you on receiving the master's degree and I want to encourage you to stay in touch with Chris and the University of Michigan, now your alma mater. And I wish you wonderful professional and academic careers in the future. Well done. Olga Mayorova, Director Chris. Um, on my part, as the undergraduate advisor for Chris this year, I also want to warmly congratulate everyone. It has been a pleasure working with you as you, ha as you have pursued your degrees. Uh, your work is really inspiring, especially in its interdisciplinary aspects. Uh, your intellectual and scholarly rigor has combined with the demands of cross-disciplinary training, spanning literature, art, film, history, politics, social science, probably other areas I am forgetting, and everything anchored throughout by the study of languages. As you continue to push on yourselves in life, I hope you will connect your regional conceptual and linguistic expertise with your future pursuits in multiple rewarding ways. All the best and also please stay in touch with the University of Michigan and with Chris. Um, now I will have the opportunity to present uh, certificates to our uh, graduates. We will start with a Master of Arts in Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Again, as the case before, some of the students may be in court or elsewhere, <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully some of them will be here. Um, Rebecca Dulemba. Colin Fitzharris, dual degree with law. No. Um, Victoria Garcia. <laughs> Roxy Lu. Reina Sacco. <laughs> Benjamin Sweeney. <laughs> yes, dual degree with public policy as well. Now, graduate certificate from Rees, uh, Krista Goff. And now I will uh, go through um, Bachelor of Arts in Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, starting with um, Alison Hester, Viktor Ivanov. <laughs> Leslie Kucharski, obviously she is here. <laughs> Andrew McIntyre.
Kathleen Mikatarian. And Anastasia Tkach. And now we also have one minor this in Russian studies this year, Yasmin Naum. Um, thank you. Now I would like uh, to announce, announce our winner of the Alfred G. Mayer uh, Award for outstanding undergraduate paper in Russian, East European, and Eurasian studies. And this is Anastasia Tkach. Uh, Riz po Political Science Honors BA minor in Ukrainian language, literature, and culture. And I want to say, well, first, I guess I'll present the award, and then I will also say a few words about Anastasia's wonderful uh, project. Yes. Uh, the award comes with money. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Anastasia traveled to Ukraine several times. Uh, she uh, acquired experience in the Ukrainian parliament and this experience ultimately led her to focus on Ukraine's contemporary political situation and its country's placement within Europe. Uh, more than the simple conflict between the East and West in Ukraine, Anastasia uh, wants to show the mechanisms behind the European Union's influence in Ukraine and the factors that went into Ukraine's response to EU uh, directives. Her paper shows the immediate history and situation leading up to the important decision of the Ukrainian government to decline the association agreement. More broadly, her paper serves as an evaluation of international democratic aid and its effect on hybrid regimes by looking at the effectiveness of the EU's policy towards its eastern neighbors. The mixture of authoritarian elements with democratic ones is an important identifying feature of Ukraine as well as other countries throughout Eastern Europe and the world. And according to this work, the, um, the policies of the European Union must reflect the political ambiguity and uncertainty of these kinds of regimes. Anastasia's project ultimately argues that the failure of Ukraine's association agreement was not due to a lack of incentives on the part of the EU, but rather to the cost of democratic conditions which threatened to take too much power away from Ukrainian political actors. This argument establishes a basis to look more closely at the domestic political scene in Ukraine. In light of Ukraine's revolution and current conflict, it is important to continue to focus on the underlying structures of Ukraine's government that may prevent it from continuing to make democratic progress. This is a very brief description of a very exciting, uh, to my mind, project. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, our final presenter today uh, will be uh, Danny Cole, who, will be, who is the program administrator from our Islamic Studies program, and she will present certificates to the Islamic Studies program graduates.
Thank you, everyone. I am Danny Cole. I'm speaking on behalf of our director, Pauline Jones Luang. She couldn't be here because of personal reasons. So anyway, the Islamic Studies program, the goal of the Islamic Studies program is to create an environment for people on campus and the Ann Arbor community to come together and learn more about this religion and what it means. It's in the news all the time, and it's a very hot topic. Um, it's a very exciting time. We just received a $3 million Mellon grant um, to create a virtual curriculum for Islamic studies. So we're going to be meeting in Chicago with the um, Big Ten universities and the University of Chicago. We're going to meet together and throughout the next five years come up with an Islamic studies minor where everyone can come together and learn more about Islam, which is very exciting. Um, secondly, we also have programs throughout the year. We have seminars and workshops. Um, this last semester we had a um, seminar on Islamism in Southeast Asia, and um, we also did a workshop on digital Islam. And also we have an interdisciplinary seminar on Islamic studies. This is run by graduate students, so throughout the year we invite speakers from all over the United States to come and work with graduate students on different topics. But not least, we also have a minor, and I'm here to introduce those people. Please, when I say your name, come up. Um, Farah Urzoki, are you here? No? Nora Deher? No? Selena Khan? Finally, um, Miriam Kazbor. All right. We'll be mailing these certificates. <laughs> Thank you. So that concludes the formal part of our presentation today. Let me uh, extend once again my congratulations to all the graduates and to the family members who are present. Um, there is a reception following um, immediately here in the gallery, but let me please ask the graduates to remain for just a second or two because the photographer would like to take some group photographs. Okay. Thank you again for coming. <laughs>